Look at how proud you are. Yes. Look at that smile, ladies and gentlemen. The I'm a very high achiever. He clapped. That was well uh, rendered, if I may say so. Congratulations on your well rendered clap. Derek Tam hyphen Scott. Thank you. At Jason Camisa. Thank you. This is the What did we decide your you we decided you had a new middle name. I forget what it Maria. was. Maria. No, it was After Enzo else. Ferrari. Oh yes. There was Enzo, something else. It's Enzo Anselmo Maria Ferrari. Uh, it was something else? Something recently. Raquel, Rachel. Um, maybe it was pterodactyl. Uh, this episode of the Carmudgeon Show, the 106th, uh, is brought to you or is part of the Haggerty Podcast Network and addresses Hondas of various types. Including Acura. Including Acres. one cylinder. Uh, did yes. we talk about any two cylinder Hondas? No. One cylinder, three cylinder, four cylinder, six cylinder Honda products. Yeah. Uh, Damn it! No, man, we didn't talk about any with more than that. But you mean we are not going to talk? So yes. this is this is the intro that's definitely right. not recorded after we've done the episode. Correct. So we are going to talk about one, three, four, and six cylinder. We didn't talk about a five cylinder Honda. Oh, the Vigor. Damn it! Next time. Oh, we've discussed the Vigor before. What's to say? Transverse five cylinder. No longitudinal, longitudinal. front wheel drive five cylinder. Yeah. It's always like my brain says it's vigor like is something it shouldn't be, and it's yeah. it's longitudinal. Yes, like the Audi way. Honda line, never in line five, ten for the road. Um, for the road, I guess not. But they did make that straight six for the motorcycle thing with the with CBX. The, oh, the best sounding, which thing. is a copy of an Italian bike. Of course, I don't care. I've heard the way it sounds, and I want one. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so we're going to discuss all things Honda, including and especially the NSX first generation uh, and the current Civic, Civic Type, Type R, R and, and Integra Type S. Yeah, exactly those two cars. Three uh, cars. Stay tuned. Also, I am expected to tell you all about the Hackerty Drivers Club. Uh, where you can join and get roadside assistance for your classic cars. Check. I've definitely done that. Yeah, so we've definitely done that. Uh, you can also get uh, a magazine. Check. You get uh, discounts on cool stuff from like Griot's Garage and a whole bunch of other places. I haven't done that. You should. I should. I mean, you've paid full price at Griot's Garage, uh, but you I can have, get a yes. discount. You have access to uh, analytics. The, the, the um, valuation, valuation tools. tools. Yeah. Something like that. Whatever. There's a link. That's what we do. Okay. But that's what they do. Um, I, we do this. We bullshit. Well, put on your bullshit waiters because there's plenty there's coming. Plenty of us coming. Good. We actually argue. Um. You were being a dick. Yeah, you deserved it. <laughs> the old post lunch yawn. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> um happy monday unhappy monday tired we ate I'm tired why monday. do we do this to ourselves we ate because otherwise i would be in power save mode i wouldn't be awake <laughs> i would just be like comatose uh how was your weekend it was good i was meeting my beat beating my meat wow meeting. impressive i was beating I hope my we were beat. very productive <laughs> Uh, I was, uh, it was good. It was a hundred million degrees here because as you probably have realized, the entire world is on fire. Um, Except with, for a small section of the most coasterly part of California, Northern California coast. Why were you on the coast and freezing? I mean, it was like foggy and it burned off midday. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it was about a hundred degrees where I store the cars, but at the warehouse, but I was continuing to work on the timing belt on the beat. Continuing, continuing for such a small car it's quite a lot of hours to do the timing belt i'm probably five hours in but that includes a lot of dicking around leaving it for a week wait, working for half an hour or whatever um it's a pain in the ass to do a timing belt on that on that car i mean what is the origin of the ass pain removing the exhaust Ugh. so did the car come from somewhere that made it crusty not real, not particularly, not bad. Can you imagine how unpleasant that would be if someone had to regularly you do, do a I timing mean, belt and pull the exhaust? Here's the, the thing: it always just welds itself on. Every well seven rusts. years or ten years or something would be bad enough, but it's been twenty three years since this is done, so it's been a long time oh, since, since that since exhaust was on. Ever, yeah. Uh, so I was genuinely nervous. Um, 
Honda uses unbelievable hardware. Honda's hardware is, I think, the best in the business. Certainly the best I've ever seen. So it's very rare to strip a bolt, strip a bolt head, strip anything. Uh, and the exhaust studs were very difficult to get to, but I was able to get a little penetrant on it, left them. I didn't use any heat, and I got all of the studs out. All the nuts mm. off, no problem. Okay. Um, but hey, you good have one. It, it was good. It was good. Um, then the next pain in the ass is you got to support the motor and pull a motor mount out. Uh, there's just a, there's not a lot of room to work. And like, there's one bolt. I don't remember what the hell it was holding on at this point. It was a couple weeks ago that if you back the bolt out, you can't get the, there's not enough room between the engine and the frame rail to actually get the bolt out. So yes. there's a hole in the frame rail right. and you back the bolt into that hole, you remove a cover and then you can get the bolt out. But of course everyone drops the bolt inside directly of the inside. frame rail. So yeah, I had it halfway out and I put tape on it with a string just to make sure. And then I had a magnet ready to go, but it was, it was okay. You just have to have little tools and I luckily have enough tools so far. The only issue that I had is you need a 12.10 millimeter, which I've never seen before. Like who I, no one else uses that but i had one um made it work and then the big issue was i had one bolt that it was so rounded that previously I, I, previously yeah the head was so rounded off it didn't even look like a bolt like i was up there and I, some wonderful person i think i said this before made like a instructions 96 i think steps instruction is over 48 pages and I, i'm looking for this bolt and i couldn't find it and i kind of sprayed it with brake clean and i'm like is that lump of molten metal a bolt and it was um and i amazingly got it out i mean it, it was unrecognizable Using a socket i used a extractor socket which sort of cuts in as you turn it counterclockwise and i whacked it on first of all i should say it was probably two inches recessed into a cavity between engine block and i guess timing cover i don't remember this is early in the process and so you couldn't there's no way like i could have welded on anything to twist it it's it's in there and it all it holds is a heat shield and it's kind of nothing so i thought oh, i'm gonna have to cut this fucking heat shield off and i don't know i'm gonna have to drill this thing out with a long bit it's gonna be a disaster so i but i took the extractor bit and i smashed it smacked it with a hammer pretty hard and got it to bite and then just smacked it with a hammer smacked it, put a ratchet on it and whack and it just came right out fucking did you Honda. buy a replacement no yeah but you should i will I need yeah. to. I found a very similar bolt that's only like, you know, maybe a half centimeter longer. And I'm hoping that fits. If not, I'll have to go go to the Honda dealer and buy a friggin' bolt. But it's directly above the cat. Honda dealer? I mean, will it be is it specific to the beat? It's not specific, but it's a it is a really heavily, beautifully CAD plated bolt. And I'm afraid to replace it with anything of lesser quality because uh, it's directly above the cat. In, yeah. It's just oh. it's subject to so much heat. Um, but other than that, it was all good to get it apart. Um, the water pump had been leaking, so I'm glad that I the kit that I had has a new one in it. Um, and so the new water pump is in. All the new pulleys, the pulley, the tensioner, it's all new. I'm ready to put the belt on, and that's where it gets really scary. Yeah, cam timing. Yeah, I mean, one little. And fuck I'm up. sure it's an interference motor. There's yes, not enough space for that motor to not be an interference motor because yes. it's so t externally <laughs> it's dimensionally tiny. tiny. And the other thing is, so the motor is angled forward at a huge angle, it's like 30 degrees. Mm -hmm. And so you pull the valve cover off this way, and that's that's the front of the car, and the valve cover is pretty close to the firewall. And so you got, I got to do a valve adjustment. You can barely valve even adjustment. see. From the you certainly not from the bottom, but for, even from the top, you can barely even see the the cam. Um, it is really tight in there. What a pain in the ass! Just stick a feeler gauge in there, and hopefully it's all good. And I don't know if I'm gonna. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, my valve sounded perfect. Noisy? Yeah. So I might I might skip that set, but um, yeah, mid engine cars are a pain in the ass. Mid engine micro cars <laughs> are an even bigger pain in the ass and smaller pain in the ass. Smaller pain in the ass. Uh, tighter pain. In the, yeah. I, uh, well, uh, whatever. I'm glad to learn that the original timing belt, which was 23 years old, uh, looked absolutely beautiful. Oh, good. Yeah, I was hoping there was just one piece of dental floss holding the whole thing together and like I'd fully, <laughs> fully used, used up, it up. Yes, but expended no. its yeah. entire capability. Yeah, so I'm nervously uh, going to put that back together in the next couple of days and turn the key and hope for the best. Okay, Nothing. well, Honda ownership. Honda ownership. My first ever Honda. Yeah, I've uh, I have a 2005 Honda CRF 230. 
That is not a vehicle. I mean, it's not an automobile. It's not an automobile, but it is a Honda. Okay. Do you work on it? Uh, I have changed the oil. I've replaced the spark plug. I've replaced the battery. Single spark plug. What, just one. Just the one? Just wow. one. I thought I was economizing with three. Yeah. Um, yeah, it has 26 horsepower. It actually, I mean, I, I it goes 10, 11 months without getting used. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it always starts instantly. Like fourth compression stroke really? after not running for 10 or 11 months meanwhile i have a yamaha which is a 230 also and that thing it's like i have to charge the battery and put it on a tender and it's like a probably a cumulative total of three to four minutes of cranking with the starter before it'll start is it carbureted or fuel injected? it's carbureted they're both carbureted, they're both carbureted. Wow. yeah that's crazy uh but yeah the yamaha is always a bitch to get started and the honda always starts right up Honda, I yeah. mean, the Except only for your generator. I was going to say the only Honda that's ever been a pain in the ass from start to finish is my generator. I think if I started start it once a month, it's eight ten poles. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I wait three months, it's twenty five thirty poles. Yeah, it just doesn't want to start. We used it once to uh, make espresso at Cars and Coffee out mm-hmm. of the trunk of the Giulietta, as one does. <laughs> yeah, uh, no can one you bring ever it, does. Can you bring your generator to Cars and Coffee so we can make espresso out of the trunk of the Giulietta, please? Sure. Sure. Okay. Yeah, and then I you, you laughed at me in the parking lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You uh, needed to do the uh, electric drill start. Yeah, you can't get to the crank on that. Trust me, I've tried, mm-hmm. um, or I've thought about that. But yeah, no, it's 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 weird. It, there's something's wrong with that. From the day I got it, and the the warranty center tried and couldn't fix it, but they said it was totally fine. But it actually doesn't run right. It surges uh, if I don't choke it a little bit, ram, ram, ram. and then if I just move it just like a tenth of the way to choke, it smooths right out. Gets great fuel economy. Runs for hours. Runs my whole house. I mean that little suitcase size generator if anyone's listening from the electric company this is uh, entirely fictitious but what i did was i think i've said this before i chopped together four extension cords to make two male to male extension cords um i disconnect service oh my god i'm gonna get so many comments on this disconnect service from from <laughs> from the PG&E. from pg e and then I take it the the generator's got two outlets on it so I take each one plug one end of the uh, extend, the rep, the corresponding extension cord and then both into an outlet that I wired in each one that's fed with one bar of the uh, circuit breaker box so your breaker box has your every house in America for those of you who are outside of Europe or, or outside of the US or, or don't normally try to electrocute yourself you have two lines that come into your house each is 120 volts put together is 240 so that's how you get 240 uh, so your circuit breaker panel is split in the middle and half of your house runs off of each one of those 120 volt supply lines um, so what i do is i have i have one out one outlet where each socket uh, one's run off the left bar, one is run off the right bar and i plug each one into the generator and then i have another secondary i have three safety things number one i have to have the um, the mains power sh- switched off. Then I have a circuit breaker for that outlet. If it's a double circuit breaker for that outlet, then I have a transfer switch that I run. Um, all of which are protected, and I'm trying to not blow shit up. But I can start the generator, and it puts out 2,000 watts. 2,000 watts is enough to run everything in the house, provided I don't turn on any 240. I also shut off all the breakers for all the 240 stuff. Um, but provided I don't do anything like turn the toaster oven and on the microwave. and while the fridge is running or something like that. And the beauty of having such a small generator is at two, it's 2,000 watts peak, but 1850 sustained. 1850 sustained is the max you can pull from one socket. So even if 1850 is being pulled through that one thing and maxing out the generator, I can't overload that circuit. And I have had the generator, uh, the fridge kick on while I was doing something else or something happened and <laughs> the generator just pops off. It's got a, it's got a circuit breaker right on it. Um, so that's and my ghetto solution. this is what you do in, solu- in case of power outage. Which tends to happen annoyingly often because pg e will shut the entire fucking county down when there's wind in the summer. In to prevent a, the entire fucking county from burning down. I have subterranean power. That's the problem. All of those power, though, all those fires came from power lines. Not in my neighborhood. But they're all well, subterranean. Not in your neighborhood, but probably elsewhere in the T and D in the transmission and distribution stack. So, yeah, two years ago, I was three full days with no power. Well, I wasn't. Then the rest of the neighborhood was no traffic lights, no nothing. So what I did was I just texted all my neighbors and I'm like, okay, here's the way this is gonna work. I'm gonna have a fridge running the entire time. 
Uh, so the first time it happened, I said, I'm going to run the generator 10 minutes an hour. That's it. Second time, I'm going to run it full time. At any time you guys need to put stuff in, in my fridge, go for it. Fridge and freezer are empty. Do whatever you need to do. Um, and that was in exchange for the running for three days. But a couple okay. of them threw shit in my fridge. They didn't lose their food. I got to have lights on and internet worked for the first day and a half, I think. Pain hmm. in the ass. But thank God for that on generator because that that does the fog machine when we're out on location. That uh, that powers everything. That little thing's mm -hmm. amazing. As long once you get it started, you just got to use it more often. That's the Honda. I'm gonna go home today and start it and let it run. Okay, <laughs> that's a good idea. What I should do is swap the carb on from your Honda motorcycle. Mm. Clearly, it's good for 33 horsepower. I only need three. Yeah, uh, and if it's yeah. Anyway, um, so the subject of today's episode is Honda, apparently appropriate because you just drove a bunch of hondas when we were filming i did yeah. yes and i think we don't have any honda outboard uh motors situations i'm just trying to think of all the miscellaneous honda products that i've always wanted a honda mower cars. but i oh. wouldn't I, I don't well because they're amazing they sit Why all winter and go, i don't yeah. have enough grass to justify having i bought a 50 dollar craigslist mower 13 years ago is this the one that you got red hot no, this is a different no, one. No, that was a different one. That one I got red hot and I was lighting the grass on fire. That was <laughs> hilarious. I had one I snapped a crank. I had zoysia grass, if anyone's ever heard of this, in two houses, three houses ago. And this grass was incredibly thick and incredibly beautiful. It was like walking on a carpet, but it would die in, this is in the Northeast, it would die in October and come back in May. So half the year it was brown. And then in the spring, you would have to thatch it to get all the dead shit out and to allow room for the, uh, for the new growth. And that was a pain in the ass that took, you know, days of work. And then cutting, it barely grew. That was the other benefit. Barely grew, but it was so thick that I kept breaking lawnmowers. So one of them, I just pushed it a little too quick and snapped the crankshaft. And it was always like, they were like $25, like Craigslist lawnmowers. Uh, and one that I rigged to run at absolute wide open all the time. So I would start it and then have to push really fast to, to get it to not over rev. And it was just sitting at full load, full revs for, I don't know, 40 minutes while I was mowing pretty slowly. I mean, you could only really push it like genuinely this speed. And I was like, oh, God, I'm patient. And I started pushing a little faster. And then I'm like, what are all those sparks? And it was lighting all the dead grass on fire as I was going through because the blade was so hot. <laughs> but, it, you know, it worked. Um Anyway, no Honda mower. No, no Honda, Honda mower. But okay, so you... Honda we, cars. Honda cars. Car mudgeon show, not you, mudge, motor, motor mudgeon show. Not lawnmower mudgeon yeah. show. You drove the Civic Type R. I drove the new Civic Type R and the uh, Acura equivalent, the Type S, mm -hmm. Integra Type S. And? And the Integra Type R. The original. The original. And the NSX, which I have plenty of other seat time in. And the S2000, I just moved. I still have never really driven an S2000. I've driven around the block a couple times. Uh, and this one, I moved from the paddock to the start drag racing starting line. Mm -hmm. And I still have never dr really driven uh, an S2000. You should. I know you hate it. Hate is a strong word, but I hate it. Yes, um, I knew that was Okay, so this was... This was it's second gen, so it's 2.2 liter, so it's got a lot more torque down low than the two liter. It only rev only revs to, to eight grand 8, 000, yeah. instead of nine or eighty nine hundred. Um, driving position is pretty terrible. Um, in what axis? The steering wheel is in your lap, and it's not adjustable for rake or reach. So it's too low. Uh, it's too low, and it's kind of far away. I want it. I want it kind of up here, close and high, and it's the opposite. It's far and low, like an E thirty. <laughs> No, E30, well, yeah, well, no, 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 E30 is far and high. Yes, <laughs> yeah. like tilted. A, like, a, like any normal car, we kind of, you know, it's just an unusual driving position. It is a perfect design. I think the car is beautiful outside. It's beautiful interior. I think co really? covering the radio was a stroke of genius because it's one of the things that ages a car very quickly. Um, and so you're left with a full flat panel with nothing in it pretty cool gauges and then you have you know uh controls to the left of the wheel for the stereo that'll you know, do volume and um and tuning and and engine starting engine start on the left hand with a key on the right i mean that's just kind of annoying um but the engine is magnificent except it's the least it's my least favorite of all the crazy honda four cylinders mm. like the k24 k20 they were they're 
that have much more personality. And then the B16 and B18, the little the little guys, more, also more personality. And they sound better. This is a little harsh. On the, like Honda 4s are usually really smooth and really happy with that crazy guttural intake noise. And this one just, mm. I don't know. And it's got electric power steering. Mm-hmm. So that kills it early e pass to bad e pass. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's beautiful. Chassis? You know, I don't trust them. Everyone spins them and says they don't know why they spun them. And I haven't had, admittedly, I have not had any really at the limit time in those cars. I borrowed one from a friend last year when I was in Boston. Um, and a week before I got it, he spun it. <laughs> into a guardrail so uh you know and yeah well, you super know someone else damage. Was, so that makes you know at least two people who spun their s2000s yeah. i mean I, I remember when those cars were new watching autocrosses and every time the s2000 came up everyone ran to watch because you knew it was going to be a big spin and it, he never fucking disappointed just going into fucking lower low, low earth orbit every single d- uh, weekend um but yeah i mean i don't know i'm not i wasn't going to push my friends after right after he spun it yeah, um, cars that you can't trust up to the limit always the enjoyment is considerably less because you're just like, like the the sensation of, I don't know, like the Carrera GT. You're just like, oh god, what ca- terrible catastrophic thing am I about to, right, unleash on some other person's car? Well, and the thing is worth as much as a friggin' neighborhood. So, uh, but I, you know, I that CGT is an interesting one because I'd really like to have one on an open track where there's nothing I can hit. Because I want to know what the hell is happening. You get so many divergent stories yeah. where, you know, I have somebody who's definitely not named Randy Popst call it diabolical. Uh, and then somebody who's not named Larry Webster, who's my boss's boss's boss, said it was a cake. Well, just he, a piece of cake. To I mean, around. it just probably depends. Circumstances, setup. Who know. the heck knows? Yeah. Yes. Mysterious. Anyway, um, but yeah, so those Hondas are pretty interesting. So, I mean, so these were all together for a Cooter episode for Ultimate Drag Race Replay. Um, and it was basically Honda's greatest hits. So uh, that NSX. That NSX was not the finest example I've driven. Okay. Because it's an NSX or because that particular one was a little beat up? It was a little grumpy. I thought ultimately it was fine. Like, mm-hmm. it seems to do fine. Initially, like, my first impressions of it were not very good. But then, like, when I was actually launching it, it seemed to do fine. But, like, it just was a little reluctant to start. It had a lot of vibration. There was some kind of noise from the steering column. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just did not inspire, like, confidence or a, an impression of mintiness. I also don't know why the driver's seat looked... Like it was An really comprehensively yeah. pre-owned. Yeah. A very jagged elephant. I mean, it was really <laughs> torn up. <laughs> elephant, elephant wearing a lot of bedazzled sort of yeah, rhinestone yeah. Or, um, coats. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, but, you know, launching it, it seemed to do fine. The air conditioning worked, which I appreciated. Uh, but yeah, it was, a. I mean, that, that really, that, situation of exercising it for me really threw into the uh, focus one of your big complaints about that car which is how long the gearing is Mm -hmm. because when we were running it against the integra type r and the s2000 the instructions from the director were to run it to the end of second gear and i I was at the end of the quarter mile and like everyone else is all in the back having already stopped and slowed down and i was like i'm not to i because you know and then eventually i realized it was because the car had such long gearing that i was running much farther than everyone else was because Mm -hmm. it has such long gearing uh it's like what 82 or 86 mile an hour yeah second? It, uh, yeah i think that's right low 80s yeah. uh and so um, yes the the gearing just despite that it was still you know well i mean i should hope it's performing better than an integra and in a drag it is race power to weight wise it beats it beats the other guys what i like about that engine is it's tractable what i don't love about that engine is first of all we should Say it's the only naturally aspirated double overhead cam VTEC V6 Honda has ever made. Um, Honda has only ever made that one twin cam V6 up until recently. The new turbo, uh, the new turbo motor is twin cam. I think we've talked about this before. But um, the nice thing about that engine is very tractable. It's got power down low. Unfortunately, it also doesn't have a VTEC kick. Yes, it doesn't. Um, I specifically, when I first, the first time I, or actually, no, it wasn't the first NSX I drove, but the NSX Type R, um, the Honda NSX Type R video, I was looking for that because I'd done a bunch of research and I was like sort of expecting to experience that. It's, there's, 
Nothing, as far as I could tell. You can hear a, a, an intake note change. There's you no get a change little bit in thrust, more, though. There's no, there's no step function. Yeah. Unlike, for example, so the, Honda, the, the, uh, the Force uh, Type Honda's. R. Yeah. yeah, the Integra Type R. Um, the old Integra Type R is I, like Honda's most magnificent engine, I think. P18 yeah. C5. So 8,900 or 9,000 RPM is the fuel cut. Mm -hmm. um, crazy t cam timing change. Mm -hmm. It really is too At complete. 5,000 500 or something like that somewhere in there i don't remember but it's got two totally different personalities and i kind of love that mm -hmm. uh, long first gear though yeah um unfortunately that seems to be a common theme here because the s2000 same thing off the line holy shit is it dead even as a 2.2 yeah that's the problem with when you have a car that has a peaky engine and a long first gear i mean that's just asking for it's the opposite of what I've noticed Subaru does this. They put a, like what feels like 50% of the torque is in the first like tip in of the mm -hmm. throttle. So mm -hmm. the thing always leaps off the line, even if it's like a Forester naturally asp aspirated automatic, it just leaps off the line. And then you realize that this, this last 75% of the throttle doesn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And then it's all at the beginning. So that, you know, on the test drive, someone will be like, honey, it's so peppy. Right. And you're just like, Ugh. but anyway, the, the Hondas are the opposite of that, right? It's, there's a, like a ton of, no, there's nothing down low and you have long gearing it's just like ugh. yeah getting the s2000 off the line so this were you know these were museum cars i was trying to be nice to them the the quick way to get an s2000 off the line is a red line clutch thumb so seven red seven, line seven thousand <sighs> depends on the tires this one had psas fours mm. i'm sorry i think this one had uh pilot sport fours they were grippy as shit mm. um and so that meant it was going to have to be an 8,000 RPM clutch dump, and I was not about to do that. So what I was doing was a 3,500 3, to 4,000 RPM um, modulated slippage, and it was fine, but there was just kind of nobody home until until five grand that kick over, um, which is fun, but I would have to, if I owned one of those cars, I'd have to put a diff in it with a shorter gear ratio because you can't final drive i mean the thing is you know you've probably noticed this you drive modern cars or any car and th that has a trick computer what's your average speed it's 32 miles an yeah. hour like no matter what you do um no matter where you drive unless you're like literally in the country with no red lights your speed is always 20 yeah, to 35 doing, miles like, an intercity hour. yeah in long town distance. in a small town it's still your your average speed is still 20 something miles an hour yeah you know high 20s low 30s to which I say, why is it that this car cannot get into VTEC until that speed? So you're you're you know that you're spending more of this car, more than half of this car's life under the speed uh, in the speed under which you can actually get to the high rev cam. I think that was such a strange omission by Honda back in the day, mm -hmm. um, especially when you compare it to the amount of torque available in the modern turbocharged cars. Right. Then you can sort of fix it with torque. Yeah um okay so old cars cool new cars you drive um, them both um you have do you want to have or do we want to discuss nsx anymore before we move on mm, since you have good. an upcoming or do should we i think that save that be. you have a uh, uh, i can i think october. august mid-august you have a i don't remember when it's scheduled but we have told completed me august 17th that's when it's currently scheduled but it might move around mm, uh right. we have a completed uh NSX, revelations na1 uh episode and I'll be honest, it was a tough one for me because I'm, you know, I don't like the NSX. It's not my job to like the car. It doesn't matter whether I like it or not. And in fact, the best and worst part of, it, of Revelations is it doesn't matter whether the car is even good or not. That's not relevant. But I do have to make the argument that the, the I, or I have to ask the question of whether the NSX was a failure because it didn't sell to the extent that they expected it to. So any right, car. the factory was always running under capacity. Yeah. Uh, first year it was over capacity and then it died off tremendously and so i have to define a successful car from in economic terms because companies are not in business to make cars they're in business to make money um, unless and, it was built to go racing which is ultimately there to sell more cars to make more money but yes um their honda you know honda is judged unless as, you're enzo ferrari Stop blowing holes in my argument. Sorry. Yes, you're totally right. But Enzo made street cars to finance the racing. Yes, but he didn't go racing in order to sell more street cars. Okay, true. Fair enough. Stop it. Um, <laughs> after lunch, I can't argue with you. I'm too tired. Um, 
No, I just think if I look at Honda's expected sales volume of the original NSX versus what they achieved, and also... Question wh- for wh- a counterpoint for additional... <laughs> <laughs> um, God, this is one of the few times we disagree on something, so you're going to be a fucking asshole are, about no, this. No, are there you? cars that you like that you... But you, but you don't consider it a success? Why is it that, for example, choose a car that you really like but wasn't a success? Do you like it any less because it wasn't successful? It's a, like, it's, it's asking whether the car was successful truly the metric for judging whether the car was a failure or not okay like, it doesn't matter whether i like the car or not right i'm a journalist i'm here to tell a story it doesn't yeah, matter that, that the i question hate you that ask for every other car that you interact with you still call it a great car even if it was a commercial failure if it's a great experience if it's a great experience right i so, think the nsx was has failed me i, as I an use the term I used the term cardinal supercar sin yes. in the episode, and it was not me. This is not my opinion. Let me just be very clear about this. The magazines and the general buying public thought that perhaps I chose whatever words I chose were chosen very carefully. The NSX was not, had committed the cardinal supercar um, sin by being boring. I agree. Nobody but else called th- it boring. Or a lot of people didn't. Everybody said it was great, didn't they? Everybody loved it. In the U.S. In the U.S. So this is this is a really interesting one to research because mm. in the U.S. that car got the such unbelievable praise that it was almost like everyone had been paid by Honda. Let me be very clear about this. Car manufacturers do not pay car magazines. But it was gushing, gushing, gushing reviews. And then, they, I mean, every single fucking review said this car was going to put Ferrari out of business. It was this is going to send Ferrari back to school. This is going to teach Ferrari how to build a fucking car. This is going to do ever, all this all this shit. And it didn't happen. Not only did that car not teach Ferrari anything other than you need to put cold air conditioning in the car, which is really what the difference between 348 and 355 was. Slightly nicer interior. And it was a, a good bit faster and stopped trying to kill people at high speed handling wise. But really it got ice cold air conditioning and a, you know, and a squishy button interior that made everyone... Go ooh, ah, until it became sticky. Yeah. Um, what what the NSX did was capture everyone's uh, attention here in the U.S., especially with all these positive reviews, and then flopped completely in the dealership to the point where the by year two and a half, I think it was, the factory was running at ten percent of capacity. That's not good. I mean, you would think by year two and a half, you're 40 or 50%, 10, and it never went above 10, sustained for more than a couple of months until the 15 year end of that. So this was not a lot of cars. Why do you think the car is so revered now? Okay, let me just say. Or do you want to finish that? Let me finish that thought. And then we'll because to this outside question. the US, it was not nearly as positive. The reviews were it's competent but boring. From start to finish, every like all the German stuff was competent but boring. All the Australian stuff was, you know, they were talking about it. Uh, you drive a, the hell was the line? Wheels magazine had a great line about it. There, you you drive a Ferrari with biceps and bravado, and you drive an NSX with your tips and brain, right? Okay, so the question becomes, what do you want out of your supercar? Do you want a car every day? Um, that's just usable and it feels like you're driving an Accord or do you want it to light your fucking hair on That's fire? kind of the 911 experience to some extent in terms of everyday usability. Yeah, but I think a 911... Except for then when you start moving, then the car is like, all right, <laughs> cars, <laughs> let's get serious. Let's get serious and let's be magic and let's have charm. So yeah. what I think the, what I think happened was that the, the without shitting on my magazine writing peers, many of whom I really respect i think they got it wrong i don't think the car was ever as great as they they said it was at being a supercar okay clear differentiation right the car is incredibly well engineered it does everything well it has few problem areas it was light it was everything it should be except that it didn't want to light your hair on fire and so the car in its fourth year pat bedard from car driver whom i respect immensely and would often was the one rational grown-up in the room at Car and Driver. He would be talking, he's like, look, this doesn't work. I, you, I know you love this rear-wheel drive stupid sports sedan, right? But people need a backseat and people need a trunk and the driving position is fucked up. And, you know, he would see in his reviews the things that in th- like more rabid enthusiasts would excuse and mm-hmm. say, I don't care about that because it does, you know, power slides at 100 miles an hour. 
he wrote this incredible dissertation on why the car, why the NSX didn't get the respect that it so deserved. And it was... Uh, he provided a litany of reasons why it was so magnificent, all, all of which would make an engineer want to jerk off and not a supercar buyer. It, it was, they went on and on and on in every review about this car in elbow room. What? Like, who gives a flying fuck about el elbow room in your supercar? They were talking about tilt and telescope wheels. They were talking about, we got 25 and a half miles per gallon on a highway run. It was all rational excuses on why this car should be loved more. And if you're not, we can just put this in, in the context of someone, your sexual, like sexual attraction between two people. You either want to fuck a person or you don't. And if, there, if you've, you're introduced to a person who you don't want to fuck, there's no amount of rational excuses that your buddy can give you. Like, well, this or that or any. There's no amount that's going to change your mind about whether you want to fuck that person or not. You just don't. And I sort of see the supercar thing in the same way. You either want it or you don't. And if, you're, if you have to explain to someone why you want it and you just say, I think it's fucking hot, you've already failed. And so in the script writing process, like I, I'm trying to... So what was the thesis of that article? Of, of the thesis, Car and Drivers? Yes. Car and Drivers was, it was, it was, it was another absolute glowing um, review for the car, but it was like, and it doesn't get these, uh, it doesn't get, it's not revered the way it should be. And this is why you should love it. It was telling your buddy why you should want to fuck that chick because she's great at math. Like it just doesn't work that way. My thesis on the whole thing was, right, it seems that outside the US, it was not thought of as a spicy car. It was thought like, hey, this is a great Honda. It's an Accord, it's a supercar for, for, it's a Ferrari for Accord buyers. Fortunately, Accord buyers don't want Ferraris and I think the sales numbers then bear that out. Yeah, not to mention the price. Well, it was expensive. Right, it was expensive. It's like and, more than a 911. And it really did outperform everything. I mean, it outperformed the 348, which it launched next to, and then outperformed the 355, which was Ferrari's answer to the 348. But at that point, they were selling the 348 outsold the NSX 10 to 1. And the 348 was the flawed bad one that everyone said was going to be put out of business because of the NSX. And you can't look at this and say, well, NSX is more special because it's rare or whatever. Yet yeah, now it is. But back then, why would you buy an NSX when you could have a car that lit your hair on fire? And I think buyers wanted the car. Elbow room. No. <laughs> I'm kidding. Okay. And so what I did was I then talked about the second gen NSX, the one that just went out of production this last year. That was, I'm sorry, an unquestionable failure from start to finish. And it was the same thing. The magazines were all like <laughs> giving it that automotive blowjob is what we call the biggest automotive blowjob in the world. Everyone loved this car. For the record, I fucking hated it from start to finish. And it did, you could make it do what it should do. There was a track mode that would actually make it sound like something, but then you couldn't use gears 7, 8, 9. There were all these fucking restrictions on it. And the engineers literally sat us down and gave them these presentations about how they wanted it to start quietly in the church parking lot because they got dirty looks when they, st they started the 458 that they had there. And they're like, you need to be able to be under the radar and subtle. And we chose these Conti Sport, Con Conti Sport Contact 5Ps because they have incredible wet, incredible low temp, deep water hydroplaning resistance. And I'm like, wait a second, people in Ohio where those engineers were, don't buy Ferraris and they don't buy supercars. And by the way, if you drove your supercar in the summer in Cleveland, you probably also have an F-150 to drive in the winter because it snows and you don't, so they just, they got it all right. Their targets were just wrong. Mm -hmm. And that car was, I think, 3,000 units total sales. I mean, that was a fucking monumental sales, colossal sales failure. And it was for the same reason. This is an everyday supercar that does all these great things and doesn't offend anyone at church. It's the exact opposite reason to buy a supercar. That's why Lamborghini Urus sells more cars in five years than Lamborghini had sold in the previous 50, 000, uh, 50 years because people want a fucking middle finger not to Derek. This is a gesture for fun. People want to give a middle finger to the nun coming out yeah. in the parking lot going, stop doing donuts in my church parking lot. Mm -hmm. So it was, an, it was a really tough script to write because I have to, again, I don't care. It doesn't matter whether I like the car or not. It's fine. As an, a piece of engineering, I like it. Now to wrap it back to your question, then I'll shut up. Why is it revered now? 
because all the supercomputers, uh, supercars have become supercomputers. And so relative to all the shit you get now with automatic this and automatic that, this is actually an experience. It's naturally aspirated, it high, revs high, it looks tits. I think the car is beautiful as fuck. Um, and all the things that made it boring to live with, the lack of fires, the lack of backfires and sputters and whatever, make it an incredible car to live with today. They require no maintenance. They don't break. They don't have any problem areas. What's not to love? So the lack of character. Well, compared to modern, <laughs> but shit, yes, everything tons has gotten so dull. Right. It actually has genuine character. My experience with that car is it actually has genuine character. Although I have to say that I, I strongly prefer the Type R. Like, there's I, a very discreet difference between a three liter regular car and a Type R. Yeah, I, and I've not driven a Type R, but if, but I I believe your judgment, and I and. I suspect I would like an, a Type R. I think a Type R is kind of what a regular NSX should have been, right out the out the bat. It you know you Hondas yeah, it's still a much easier car to interact with than a contemporary Ferrari in terms of usability. Do you want usability? No, that's what I'm saying. It's mm -hmm. still a pretty. It's, it oh. would have been mild enough to sell it as a oh, mainstream yeah, product, but spicy enough to have enough personality to drag yeah. people out of the showroom. And again, we can't forget. And Acura, uh, Honda was only 25 years old when that car came out. I think, I mean, 25 years ago was 1998. 1990, imagine a car company That's came when out. when Pagani and, started. Yeah, it was young and the development was really cool. I mean, mm -hmm. I love the, oh my God, I had to leave this out of the script, but they use a Cray 2 supercomputer. Mm -hmm. And I think it's average power consumption while working on optimization for weight reduction on the car was a hundred hertz it was 175 kilowatts of power it would zap the the it has god i fuck it i did all this research it has something like one two hundredth the computing power of your iphone but would drain your iphone's battery in 0 0.04 of a second don't quote me on those numbers whatever it was i did the math for the script and we just had to cut it out for time because the episode wound up being too long but it was just really cool to look back at how far computers have come versus mm -hmm. cars um yep. but that you know there was the ayrton senna thing i think is a little bit overplayed from yep. what i can see he drove one once and didn't like it said it was weak structurally mm -hmm. um and, and they re-engineered the chassis as a result. <laughs> whole thing yeah and I then mean, there's a video of them putting him in a type r when he just drove around on circuit and it oh was on. that a type r when the loafers yeah that, that video yeah. yeah um but but honda right i mean it, and if anyone in the audience like feels like i'm shitting on honda i'm not honda doesn't fuck up and i actually start that episode by saying here two is a contradiction honda doesn't fuck up and yet the nsx wasn't a success how do you how are those two things uh, together? Honda doesn't screw up engineering-wise very often at all. To return to the question I asked earlier about um, why the NSX uh, is revered today, I think there's also an element of the people who are buying NSXs or the people who are reading the glowing magazine articles from their childhood. And I see this happen all the time. People sort of, these are emotional purchases. If you've decided at a certain point that you want something, then you have a, a permanent emotional bond to that and mm -hmm. you sort of, the majority of buyers, I see this happen with 355s often, I think it's true of NSXs also, people want a car so badly for so long that they convince themselves that they like it even if when they get it, they don't actually like it and they can't forgive, they, they can't dispose of, of their subjectivity to mm -hmm. become objective while looking at or considering or regarding a car. Huh. Uh, and so they just are... To, to do so is to change a part of your identity, basically, or, or to meaningfully change your worldview. And most people aren't really willing to do that in the face of evidence, right? We see that in the <laughs> outside of the car world yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, sure. Is that, you know, so I think that that happens. And to, I, we have a client, and to his credit, I, that he has done this. I mean, he, he was one of those F-355 guys, and he got one and imported it and went through all this trouble to get exactly the right one that he wanted and he drove it for a few months and then he bought a 964 rs and he drove it for a weekend and he said i have to sell the 355 mm -hmm. because it, dynamically they don't compare and he's a guy who goes out and hauls ass every weekend mm -hmm. i have i have a bunch of friends who own nsx's and they are all absolutely in love with it and i hate that sort of confrontation thing like i you know i'm not going to tell them the car's terrible if they love it great i'm happy for them um but they're happy for it. They're, they're in love with it for reasons that I don't think are important to me. Yeah. Um, certainly not for the steering. I don't understand how a car company can 
be make unassisted steering be so, so dead yeah. the beat is like this too um but it's not it's it's an easy car to live with now and i think that's it and as a as an object to behold it's beautiful yeah. and it's easy to interact with and it doesn't I like piss listening you off. to it yeah it sounds really good it sounds really good i kind of wish it had a psychotic v-tech changeover but yeah other than that um yeah i really would like to drive a, a six speed or a three two six speed or a type r or something um but i just i feel the same way about it as i feel about a 355 like it's stunning to look at sounds good don't care yeah the experience mm -hmm. the, the thing that i i prefer the nsx to the 355 by wide margin because the nsx to me is gratifying to hustle um mm -hmm. at least the type r the the 355 when i hustle it i just feel like i'm gonna break it i feel like i'm gonna break the chassis i feel like i'm gonna break everything mm. I, I just i don't like the steering i don't like the chassis i don't like the suspension i just i, I have not really the noise it. either of a 355 which i know most people do uh but anyway i i like i that uh, at least with the nsx you feel like you could drive it 10 tenths and it, you're not going to hurt it whereas that's with the true. ferrari i always feel like that's the case with mm. those cars yeah the 355s I mean, d dashboard pieces falling off and then sticking to your leg don't probably <laughs> inspire great confidence. Yeah, and then you look at the underneath of it and you're just like, my God, it's just a bunch of tubes welded together. Yeah. yeah. Like, ugh. I mean, the NSX was the world's first uh, aluminum monocoque mm -hmm. car, wasn't it? I mean, from an engineering perspective, I, what I love most about it is that, God, I shouldn't give all the, everything away, was that it originally didn't even have VTEC. Mm -hmm. Like, that was a big fuck up. Mm -hmm. So they was it a single cam or was that just for a prototype cam. mule engine? No, it was supposed to be this. It was a. It was the legend, <laughs> legend motor. This I guess C twenty seven or whatever it was called, or C twenty five punched out to three liters, and that was it. And it made two hundred and God, I remember it from the research like two hundred fifty horsepower. I think it was, um, and rev to seventy three hundred, and that was it. And then the president of honda at the chicago auto show they had a they had a sort of preview for uh, uh press set up and they were right next door to ford and ford was doing their this press is at 89 for chicago 89 yeah ford was doing a press conference on their crown vic um and he got under the cover of the car um got got in the car and was revving it and bouncing it off the rev limiter to find out where the red line was and he got out and said why is this car only revved to 7300 where's the VTEC?" The engineer said, well, VTEC was only intended for the four cylinders. And he's like, right now, drop your pencils, kids, and get back to work. So, yeah, they uh, they then went back in and re-engineered the car for VTEC, which actually needed, they needed to stretch the wheelbase by an inch. And then they had to throw effectively the whole car out and start over again uh, because the VTEC had the double over cam uh, heads were much bigger. But mm -hmm. they did it, and they did it right. And so they gained 20 horsepower. Um, and 8,000 revs instead of 7,300. Um, but I think really it's the bragging rights and the marketing of that was sure. VTEC's first appearance in the U.S. In the U.S., yeah. Um, and that is a technology that is just so unbelievably Honda. I mm -hmm. mean, it works. It's all benefits, no drawbacks, yes, dead reliable. With like incredible cleverness and outside-of-the-box thinking yeah. and just like engineering brute force mm -hmm. at a problem that yeah. everyone assumed was not brute force that winds up in the lightest simplest solution yes. that never breaks yes. that's the honda way yeah. um i'm fascinated but when honda gets it right holy shit like they're just they've i read i remember reading like 10 years ago that honda had never seen an actual failure of VTEC, mm. like that resulted in engine damage or anything then you know mm. they'd sort of designed it in such a way that if it failed it just didn't work mm -hmm. um but they, they had never seen an actual failure like only honda yeah um but um yeah I mean, I, I, I've, again, I felt a little bit bad. I mean, it doesn't matter that I don't like that car. I respect its engineering. And yeah. now I think it is a cool car to own now. I just can't see why I would have bought one back in the day. We have a friend who has a second gen car, first and second gen car. Oh, um, yes. And he absolutely loves the hybrid V6 automatic nine speed shit pile. Uh, I, I just. He's all over the map, though, to be fair. Got a lot of Honda products. So a little bit of Honda boy, Honda fanboy. Yeah, he's got a beat, but he also has a bunch of air-cooled 911s. Mm -hmm. He has an E28 M5. I mean, he has a Toyota 4Runner with a Lexus LS 400 powertrain swap. Have you seen this? No. Including the gauges. I need to be better friends with him. <laughs> uh, it's absolutely epic. Uh, he has a Citroen also, mm -hmm. and he has an old Jags and Lanchas. Oh, great I car. mean, he's yeah. got everything. I don't think I realized it was... And yeah, a Boxster, modern Boxster, mm -hmm. or modern i guess he sold that 20 20 years old boxster yeah. um 
but yeah, I mean, he's, he he uh, he has had a good car experience enough. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I, yeah, if you have, he he's like me. He's kind of a whore. It's it's okay. It's okay to be a whore. Right. Um, you just started. They're like, I like this. I like this. Right. I like experiences. Right. I like having a breadth of experiences. I mean, the the alternative is to be one a one mark wonder. Yeah. So I definitely prefer that. Fair enough. Yeah, I mean, listen. There will always be there's a there's a lid for every trash can, right? Mm-hmm. And there will always be a buyer for something. But I just have to I had to look at the new car as a failure of customer expectations, and therefore a failure in the sales in the sales room. Even if our buddy likes his or whoever who owns one, if you love it, great, 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 great. That makes me happy. But there are so few of you that it wound up being a failed Commercial. product. Yeah, failure. Um, and that's that. All right. Civic Type R, Integra Type S, because that is not a failure of a consumer product. I have to agree. I had just driven around in the paddock, so I didn't get much seat time in mm-hmm. them. But in that time, you know, going around a corner in second gear, uh, I there's quite a strong difference between those cars, much stronger than I was anticipating. And in my, I don't know, five minutes in each car, I mm-hmm. came away with a strong preference. Okay. For what? The Acura. You're wrong. Okay, okay. tell me why. Uh, it sounds better. <laughs> I just love it. I'm like, you're wrong. It's and you so- don't even react. Okay. It sounds better, and uh, the ride quality was appreciably better. Yes. And if the two cars have the same level of competence, then why not choose the one that rides better and sounds better? Hmm. Okay. So sound, sound is a huge difference between the two cars. Mm-hmm. Civic has, I think, an extra muffler, but... All kind. Why is the refined expensive one louder? Okay. So you're you're forcing me to get where I was going to go later. I was going to say it's not a failure of a product, but it's a complete and total failure of product planning. Mm-hmm. Um, Honda's product planning department had got a lot of things backwards. So the Acura has the full sound deadening package. The Civic Type R does not. So Civic Type R gets reduced sound deadening and then has an So absolute- far so good. Which is correct, right? Yeah, That's so what we far, expect. So good. Yeah. But then the Civic's exhaust is absent. It's completely muffled out. And the Integra gets a loud exhaust with pops and cracks and burbles. What the fuck is that about? The Integra gets the tacked on fender flares. Yes. And the visually tacked visually on. Like, yeah, visually tacked on. The, it gets the sort of JDM tuner treatment. And the Civic gets the intellectual grown-up treatment except for the wing except for the enormous wing yeah but what the fuck is that about shouldn't yeah. the boy racer car which is the civic get all of the tacked on stuff flares yeah and the accurate yeah. be the grown-up one but i that, think the civic backwards. is genuinely beautiful i'm strongly prefer to look at the civic yeah i think it's actually just super handsome throughout so they did the ride thing correct so the stiffest mode on the acura is roughly equivalent to the um to the middle mode, I think it was, on the Honda. They made that decision consciously. They're adaptive dampers. You can do what you, what, what you want with it. Um, the Civic has unbelievable Recaros in it. I think yes. they were actual Recaros. They're genuinely the some of the best And I seats. love the colorway of that car, white with the red interior. I mean, it's just so sort of quintessentially hot Honda. Yeah. And it's somehow both aggressive, but also kind of tasteful. Yeah really they nailed it absolutely nailed it but the seats and steering wheel and shifter you get in that car and it is just perfection i am in something special and i don't have to explain this to anyone um it's you know red seats but you start it up and the the car buzzes then you go over to the you don't hear anything but it buzzes you go over into the acura and you have meh seats at best um and a meh steering wheel and why would i pay eight thousand five hundred dollars more for the car that loses the some one of the best parts of the civic and the most special parts of the civic which is the seats um okay does they're they're heated it's got that and it's got that accurate stereo system is fucking spectacular like genuinely fucking amazing where the civics is just fine um but somehow the civics interior looks more expensive, more mature, more timeless, and more grown up than the Acuras, which mm-hmm. uses better materials. Mm-hmm. What is going on? Mm. What is going on? And I, dynamics? Okay, dynamics, this was interesting. Civic is relentless understeer on a track. Uh, Randy was pretty pissed off about that when we had one for uh, lap, lap battle 
or uh, no, we had it lap battle a the GR86 for that episode. It was he was just really disappointed with it. On the road, it feels good. On the road, it feels like the back end is turning with you, but that works up till about eight tenths, and then it just kind of falls into understeer. You can get it sideways if you really, if you try to, if you ask it to kill you. The Acura, I took one turn in it, which was a right hand up a very steep bend, top of third gear, so I don't know, 65 miles an hour, somewhere over there. And I turned in and the back felt like it was about to come around, so I matted it. And I wound up with a with an opposite lock slide up a hill. <laughs> Laughed myself sick. I mean, I just could not believe this car was that good. Then I took a left-hand turn and it didn't do that. Then I took another right-hand turn and had some opposite lock again. And we looked at the car. Randy, this is Randy Pope. He walks Randy up did and a visual like, alignment. Yeah, he's like, uh, "There's all what's with the toe out on the on the left rear?" So it was an alignment issue on that car, but it was assy and it was roll assy. So like you turn in and the back would as and the back when would the roll back over. Would load up the outside rear tire. So what I would do is then take a Civic and I'm putting toe out on both sides to fix that. It was spectacular in the right turn yes <laughs> not the left um both cars can carry such ridiculous pace they are so confident competent they're just it's the same reason why i loved my gti just to yeah. point to point on a mm -hmm. tight road yeah the only um, the only real drawback is uh on very on big hills and in the wet there's axle hop from hell mm. um to the point where you really think you're going to break something it's bad um and so sorry in the wet and up hills yeah because there's just not it's the there's front end's not loaded yeah. up, and that that ruined the experience for me. Civic driving Civic around San Francisco, you know, it was it was raining and it was just and just this horrendous axle tramp that you just get that bang 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 bang. Same bang. thing that the GTI does did, because you can fix that on GTI with a yeah. dog bone mount. I'm sure there's a fix for Civic too, um, but I dramatically prefer the Civic on the basis of seats and aesthetics aesthetics seats and i know that the sound is just a muffler muffler to lead away i mean i, I take a civic put an exhaust ride on it. quality i found the right i thought the ride quality was too harsh for a regular use car which mode were civic you i'd have no idea <laughs> so in comfort mode it's stiff mm -hmm. in sport it's too stiff and in r it's undrivable Mm. Um, that, I have no idea what mode it was in. I got mode, in the car. And it is bucking and heaving. I mean, you can even watch the video, the GR86 uh, episode, where you watch Randy talk about the chassis. And he isn't it barely able to talk. I mean, that's a fairly smooth track. It's bad. Yeah. Um, but the Integra in comfort mode is perfection. It's exactly what it should be. Um, and then gets pretty damn stiff. There's a huge difference. Um, how's the like ground clearance and bumping because uh, that's always my concern is for example on Bellinas Fairfax Road is dragging car parts I, like the GTI never does that my 911 there's one left hand turn when you're heading down to the coast where it does it otherwise it never does that and that's what I love about my 911 and the GTI versus like the GT3 which I just there were certain roads you just couldn't drive the car on because mm -hmm. it would spend the whole time Scraping. leaving parts of the car on the ground <laughs> So, you know, that's the, for a hot hatch, for front wheel drive mm -hmm. hot hatch, especially for me, that's a requirement is that the car has to be able to do a road like that or um, Skag Springs Road flat out right. without ever making contact. I would, I have not had any, anything, never scraped anything ever. Okay. I mean, I didn't do Bofax or any of these roads that we're talking about. These are Marin County, crazy, bumpy, twisty, really, really tight first and second gear roads. I didn't do anything like that, but I never noticed any scrapage anywhere else. Okay. I mean, they're real cars. I mean, yeah. they're at the end of the day, they're, I, I hesitate to call them hot hatches because they're fucking huge. Yeah, I know. I but mean, it's a front wheel, di front wheel drive hatchback. That's hot. Yeah. It's five, <laughs> it's, you know what it is? Front wheel drive competitor to our Rover. Hmm. <laughs> i.e. the citroen the Ci it's your citroen yeah it's a citroen um something we left out of the citroen episode was the fact that all these formula one drivers all raced them at the dubai grand prix in 1981 i love these publicity stunts you're gonna have to explain this one and then f and put an insert in this is the stupidest thing i've ever seen yeah they just got all these guys like dan gurney and innis ireland sterling moss was there roy salvadori who won them all in driving with carol shelby in 1959 uh all these like Formula One drivers, and they put them all in Citroën CXs going around the Grand Prix circuit in Dubai in 1981. And these guys are like, 
you know, Dan Gurney gets out and it's like, yeah, they would just use me as an apex or bra- as, or as brakes and bounce yeah. off of me to get through corners, going in much too fast to a corner and just bounce off of me. At some point, somebody, like everybody started cutting out a corner by just driving over Across the dirt. the field, I, or the dirt, <laughs> like, that was hilarious. Like, I have no idea why this happened in Dubai in 1981, but well, anyway. Publicity stuff. Right? Uh, yes. Same thing Mercedes did at the Nürburgring with the 2316 yeah, in 1984. And a, a, a car without any sporting pretensions. You know, at least the Mercedes is supposed to be a sporting vehicle. Like, and in what world is there a parallel or is someone who is considering buying an executive front wheel drive car being like, ah, oh, that is the thing that has pushed me over the edge and it made me decide to buy the Citroen CX. Remember last week when we decided that Citroen whatever. had the best drugs? Well, uh, that yes. that extends to really bad ideas Promotional like racing a front wheel drive soft yeah. family sedan hatchback. In the desert. No, sedan. It's, it's that looks sedan. like a hatchback. Yes. In that, yeah, crazy. Yeah. So, yeah, really fun. Um, it's a fun watch. You should put a link in the description. Yeah, I'll put a link and maybe a photo or something mm-hmm. of it happening. But th- this was pretty unhinged. Uh, okay. I could live with a Civic Type R. Yeah, I'm interested mm-hmm. in it to replace conceptually the GTI to just as an everyday car that, you know, if motoring needs to occur on short notice when you're commuting, then the mm-hmm. car is absolutely available to do that. It's, it's, it's a really good, well-rounded, everyday car. I mean, ride quality aside, it's it's stiff, but it is an R, right? It's mm-hmm. a Civic Type R. It's not an SI, mm-hmm. um, and I'm I'm fine with it riding the way it does because it's not uh, until I'd you have go into to R reconstruct mode. what I did and figure out what mode it was in and figure out whether that works for me. But it's definitely stiff. The way that I drove it, I was like, woo. Yeah. No, it, it. I think it. I, who knows? Somebody could have gotten it out and left it in R mode, but it's stiff. It doesn't on the roads around here. It didn't. It wasn't stiff to the point where I wouldn't want to drive it. Okay. It was just, it was noticeably like, you're in something different. This mm-hmm. is not a regular Civic. Um, and I would have to check it. And that does it get off. fluidity at speed? Oh, yeah. Because oh, yeah. when I, I was driving, oh, so my 964 is like this low speed, super miserable. Mm-hmm. And then as soon as you're moving over a fast, bumpy road, it's it becomes incredibly fluid. It's the, You cannot be in R mode in that car. It's okay. just so heavy and so track. bouncy. Yeah. But I just, yeah, I'm so fucking weird. Even the intake sounds different between the two cars. And we don't know why, but you rev it. First of all, the cars are a pain in the ass to launch. They don't, they won't rev past 3,500 in neutral. Right. And isn't um, it completely undefeatable traffic traction control? Oh, that's the other thing in the Acura. That Acura, would stop but not me. in the Honda. Yeah. Civic is, lets you do what you want. The Acura only has reduced traction control and no reduced DSC. Hmm. Fucking weird. Somebody in these product planning guys just so are, buy the Honda and put an exhaust on and don't that's drive all it in do. R mode. And the only problem is then you don't have heated seats. That's the only thing that would bother me. I like heated seats too much, and you, I don't think you I get do them. love having heated seats. Actually, especially heated cloth. Yeah, I I'm frequently cold. As we say this, it's 200 degrees and the whole country is melting. We need heated seats. We are in legend. July. Yep. Well, we or live August in a frosty summer. locale. Yep. Okay. Uh, glad you got to experience the old cars. Yeah, me too. And I look forward to the opportunity for more time in the Civic Type R because it sounds like it's pretty magical. I would love to take it on a good back road jaunt. We should see if we can get you one. Um, they're Right now, I think they were all r- moving away from the fleets for some marketing event. Hopefully, they'll be coming back. So I will I will ask for you. I think Derek should spend more time in the CTR. Um, I in the I meantime, buy it. <laughs> How much money do they cost? I don't know. 40, 40 grand? Yeah. 40 is a lot of money. I know. Everything's a lot of money these days. I know. That's the thing that always happens to me with old cars. When I interact with, I mean, with new cars, I'm just like, man, that's so much money. Because in old car land, even though everything's gotten expensive, you still look like at an E36 M3 for $20,000. Right. You're just like, what could I possibly buy that offers, you know, this level of sound and handling and right. entertainment and cooling system failures? Right. It was because they have <laughs> shitty interiors and cooling system failures. <laughs> And uh, uh, cha- rear part of the chassis decomposition, rear trailing arm bushing. Whatever. Differential Nothing's perfect. Yep. Fix it with the remaining $20,000 over exactly. time. It's a payment plan. Exactly. Basically. And the E36 will be gaining money, gaining value while the Civic Type R is losing. Unless you do, a, unless you do fuckboy modifications. Don't do those. Friends don't let friends do fuckboy modifications to their BMWs. Ladies and gentlemen, your public service announcement from Derek Tam Hyphen Scott. All right. Tune in next week for more probably controversial and deeply inappropriate commentary from us. From the whore and me.